So first of all, the, the major outstanding mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah, of course, is shofar. That's the, the outstanding one. The other outstanding mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah is that it's the first day of a Sarasi made tshuva. So it's shofar and tshuva. Those are the two outstanding mitzvahs. We're going to talk about shofar for the time being. When the Baal Tokea makes his bracha, So we have to understand, here we have a mitzvah to listen. A, mi- a mitzvah to listen. That is a mitzvah to raisa. Why is that emphasized? Because not everybody holds the mitzvahs to listen. Some hold the mitzvahs to to blow the shofar. Very seldom do you have a mitzvah of listening. And here the mitzvah of listening is the important mitzvah because it's not the blowing of the shofar so much as what the shofar does to you. What does it in you, what does it in you uh, 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 initiate? What does it arouse in you? That's the whole point. They blew shofar in the base of Mikdash, you know where also? Sukkis. Sukkis. When they were bringing the water from the Me'ah Shiloach, bringing it into the base of Mikdash, they blew shofar. And there, the blowing of the shofar was for Simcha. It was... Joy. Yes, it was the... the, uh, the what is it called? The, the, they danced around the Sheikh Shemes Hamayim. This, so it all depends on the subjective person. What does he do with the sounds that he hears? So the, it's Yomim Noroyim, it's days of awe, and it's supposed to arouse in you certain thoughts. The first thing is, I'm listening because Hashem told me to listen. That's it. Hashem says, Yom Trua Lielachem. It says in the Torah, Yom Trua, a day of blasts. So I'm listening. Hashem says, listen to So I'm listening. Just for that alone, you makayim the mitzvah deraisa of Shmias Kol Shofar. Whether you understand it or don't understand it, I'm hearing the shofar, I'm doing the mitzvah Hashem said to do. Now we want, of course, to have more quality in the hearing. We want it to be more meaningful to us. So we have here a list of things that you have to have in mind when you're listening to the shofar, and that's what I have on the page. Okay, the first thing is, Shofar, what did a shofar accomplish? The first thing is, number one, it says, Mamtik es hadin. Just by the Baal okay, holding on to the shofar. And generally the blowing, this is Mamtik the din. That means there is a awesomeness about the day. An awesomeness about the day. It's days of awe. And the day we're being judged. It's not only us. Realize this, Rabbi It's not only us. It's as called by Olam Ovlum Ifonov. Everyone in the world is being judged on Rosh Hashanah. Everyone in the world. And we are the ones who are making an issue of it. The, the, the Goyim of the world have no idea, no care about it at all. But the Mishnah tells us, called by Olam Ovlum Ifonov, Kivnei Moro. Everyone in the world is being judged on this day. And we want to have this atmosphere, this mindset of din, to be softened. By blowing the shofar, that's what we do. And that's what you have to have in mind, the kavana. By hearing the shofar, it is a mamtik the din. It sweetens the din. Why? Of course, it brings up a kedas yitzchak, and so on and so on. But it doesn't make a difference. How it does it, it doesn't make it how, but it, what, it, what it does do. It sweetens the din. Us blowing the shofar and listening to it sweetens the din. So that's the first thing you have to have in mind. That point, hamtokas hadin, sweetening of the din. That's number one. Number two, marzikarza almas ho elyonim betchilas hashona ayidei protet kios. We have to realize at the beginning of the year, there is a renewal. There's a renewal of those energies which begin the year. There are spiritual energies which begin the year, and those energies are renewed. They are renewed. And those are th- those renewals come when we hear the shofar. The blowing of the shofar renews the energies which are necessary to power the year. 
That's the second thing that it does. And the third thing that it does is Ma'arvev Hasatan. Now, people translate that to mean it confuses the Satan. Let's be you know, practical. Satan is a wise man. He's been around a long time. Many Rosh Hashanahs have passed by. He knows exactly what's happening. We're not going to confuse him about anything. What it means is, Ma'arvev Hasatan means it prevents him from prosecuting. That's what it does. Because of the sweetening that it did, a cause of renewal, this prevents the Satan from prosecuting. This is what you have to have in mind. And if you have that in mind, that's what it accomplishes. Remember, it's a subjective, I would say, operation here. The listening of the shofar should have quality to it, it have meaning to it. Okay. So what was the last one again? The last one, it, it prevents the Satan from prosecuting. The prosecuting that he would do on a, on a, on a day of din. He would try to prosecute against us. And know this, very important, Rabbi, see, realize this. We say, oh, you know, Rosh Hashanah is Yom Adin, but on Yom Kippur it's sealed. Until Yom Kippur, <laughs> I have time. I'm not worried. Let me ask you a question. You go to court and they give you a, the judge gives you a decree. And of course you're not so happy with it and you want to appeal it. What are your chances of the appeal being accepted? In most cases, the judges do not like to appeal or retract what they said. You have to try very, very hard. You have to have tremendous amount of, let's call it, schus, or mazel, or whatever, I don't know, in order for your, to the psaq to be changed. Good lawyer. That, that's, that's part of it, correct. The same thing goes in Shemayim. When they paskin on you, they are very well equipped to make a good psaq the first time. They don't have to do it a second time. So it's not kedai to be saimach on Yom Kippur. It says, do not to be, don't rely on Yom Kippur. The Rosh Hashanah is the most important of the Yimei Hadid. You never know what category you're in. If you're a Tzaddik, if you're a Russia, if you're a Benoni, you don't know. Assume the worst. Assume the worst. Don't give yourself the, you, you yourself, don't give yourself the benefit of the doubt. If you don't give yourself the benefit of the doubt, then in the they will give you the benefit of the doubt. You know you're not a Tzaddik and you're thinking that maybe I'm a Russia and you're doing tshuva, they look at you favorably. That's what you have to do. Don't think of yourself as a big tzaddik. I, I don't have to but I'm a good Jew. I give charity. I go to shul. I have a daf yomi shir. What's wrong? If we start to find all the faults, there's plenty to find. Everybody has plenty of faults. And who can weigh the, the, the value of all the faults? We don't know. We don't know. So since we don't know really what our situation is, do not yourself give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Assume that you have to do a real, real, honest, sincere truth. You have to work very hard. That will, Minashamayim, make the scales tip in your favor. So remember, Moshe Hashanah is the most important day. Don't be Semechan Yom Kippur. You don't know if you're a Benoni. You don't know if you're in between. Nobody can make that calculation. Only by Shemaim to make the calculation. We don't know. So we have to give ourselves not the benefit of the doubt, so that in the Shemaim they will give us the benefit of the doubt, because we realize that the situation is not like it's supposed to be. Okay, so those are the first, the major three things that the chauffeur accomplishes. And your thinking about them makes it happen with more quality, with more emphasis. It makes it happen. So underneath that, I wrote Tashat and Tarat. <coughs> so they have the, the, the first three is Tkiya Shwaram Tshuva Tkiya. All right, then you have the second group, Tkiya Shwaram Tkiya, then Tkiya Tkiya Tshuva Tkiya. What are you supposed to be thinking of during the second set? All the thoughts that we just said, I can think of in the first set. Tkiya Shwaram Tshuva Tkiya. What do I think in the second set? The second set is, listen to this, it's very important. 
I want these tekiyas to be mavatel the yetsahara, which is connected to mitzvah say. When it comes to mitzvah say, things that you have to do positively, the yetsahara will tell you, ah, you can wait. If you don't do it today, you'll do it tomorrow. Don't have to do it with such ex- excitement. What are you trying to show? You're a big tzaddik. Do it, uh, you know. There's, that's the Yetzirah, which tries to make you trip up on the, on the, on the, uh, yetz, on the Mitzvah Zaseh. So what you have to do is be mevatel that Yetzirah. That inclination to be lax, to be lazy. You get up in the morning, oh, you look at the clock, I have 15 more minutes. Why wait 15 more minutes? Come to shul a few minutes earlier. Why wait till the last minute? Come to shul a few minutes earlier. Zriz and Magdim and the mitzvahs. So you, what makes you think that way, that I can turn over another 15 minutes and sleep? What? That's the Yetzirah. So what you have to be machavin during the Tashat, is to mevatel the Yetzirah, which tries to make you be lax in the, in the mitzvahs I say. That's the, the, the Tashat. When it comes to the Tarat, the last section, there are three sections, Tashrat, Tashat, Tarat, the Vatal, the Eight Sahara, which comes to me, make you over on the Losa says. That we understand. This you're not allowed to do, and you do it. You're not allowed to speak Lush and Hara, and you don't give attention to it, you don't think, you, and you do it. So you are doing an active rebellion. When the Torah says not to do, and you go ahead and do, you're actively rebelling. When the Torah says that in a base Hamikdash, in a base Knesses, which is considered to be a miniature base Knesses, you're not allowed to speak Sichat Chulin. Mundane, everyday talk is forbidden in a base Knesses. This is a major, major world problem. It's a global problem. I bring up again what we had during the corona, for a full year, the shuls in the world were all closed. And all the Rabbanim was saying, many of them that I heard, was saying, Hashem is talking to us. Hashem is talking to us. It didn't have to happen. It could have been the shuls stayed open. Who knows the way all the government and all the regulations, they could have said the shuls stay open. But no, they all agreed. All the rabbis agreed the shuls had to be closed. They gave example uh, because of uh, Corona and you know all that. But who knows? It had to happen that way. It could have worked out differently. The shuls stay open, but the shuls were closed. The rabbis was saying Hashem is talking to us. Over the years, for decades, we have not been mechabed the base knesses as we should. Because it becomes a living room. It becomes a social meeting. The davening is just, you know, well, you have to do that too. But mainly I have to meet my friends. I have to hear what's going on. I didn't see them all week long. And all these discussions come up before davening, after davening, and when it's bad enough, in the middle of davening too. This is a very, very major problem. It's a small thing compared to committing adultery. A small thing can be committed to adultery or to killing somebody, vadai, no comparison, but something which is small and you are violating it over and over and over again, it gets the value of somebody who is Mechal Shabbos, somebody who kills. This is a concept that the secular courts have also accepted. If you have minor offenses, minor driving offenses, over and over and over again, you are considered as being a major offenser. This is a known fact. Known fact. I'm, I've, heard, I've heard this. Minor offenses, if they are in abundance, is considered a major offense. This comes from the Torah. Take minor averus, which are transgressed over and over and over again, it gets the value of something which is chayv karas, something which is chayv misa. Hey, Rabbi Sai, it's painful to talk about it. Mom is painful to talk about it. I'm 
trying to always find schus, trying schus in Kali Yisrael. But this is something which stares at me in the face all the time. And unfortunately, it's still going on. So what do I know about all the discussions that people are having when I'm looking at them? Maybe they're talking about Torah and mitzvahs. Okay, could be. It could be. But there are things that I hear with my own ears. So there are a lot of things that can be put off till you go outside the shul. You want to talk to somebody? Okay, it's nice to see him talk to him. Come outside, we'll talk. It has to be inside the shul, in front of the Yom Kodesh. These are major things, Rabbi Said, because they're constantly being transgressed all the time. Okay. A makom shul is a makom kadosh. It's Hashem's house. Do not think of it as your own house. Think of it as a Hashem's house. And each time, even though you walk in there three times a day, don't think it's your own living room because you're coming so often. It's still Hashem's house. In Hashem's house, you have to act differently. Okay, the last section on the page in front of you. We have three times that we blow the shofar. One is before Musaf. A second time is either during the Salish Monastery or during Chazar Sashatz. The Divim and Hagim about that. The third time is after Shmona Esrei. And then there's an extra 10 at the end to finish off the 100 kolos. So what are we supposed to be thinking about during these three times? In addition to what we already spoke about. In addition. You'll notice that they all have one common thing. Bittel Yetzirah. The first line says, the name Musaf, Mevatlim Yetzahara Shalavod Zara. Now you might think, in our generation, we have a connection to Avod Zara. Where do we have Avod Zara? Ideology. Huh? It's more than ideology. More than ideology. The answer is, I heard very nice from Rabbi Elimelech Biederman. He quoted from, I don't remember who he quoted from, but he said the following. People learn Torah and they, they work. They make a living. They're panasa. Either they're in business or they're in academics. And they're teaching, or they're doing research, whatever. And they have a inner feeling that they have to put their maximum koach, their maximum concentration, their ingenuity in order to accomplish and to be successful. And they make all kinds of calculations and computations and they have meetings and we have to do this and we have to do that and I have to improve on this and improve on that. And they're successful, and they say, oh, you see, we planned right, we did it right, and Baruch Hashem, we have, we have, we have success. Or why did we suffer such a loss, you know, because we were careless. We didn't take care of this, we didn't take care of that, we overlooked it, we were negligent, therefore, we suffered. That is a Zara. That's a Zara. What's the Avodah Zara there? You think that your success in the world is dependent upon you. That's what I deserve. That's what I deserve. You forget that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one who decides your parnasa. You say it in Shmon Esri all the time. Borei Chalenev Sashon HaZois. You ask him for a parnasa. Paseach es yodach o mazbi elechol chayrat. You ask Hashem for the parnasa. So if you ask Hashem for the parnasa, where do you get into this false ideology, if you want to call it, like Rabbi Yaakov Meir said, this thought, mind process, that your ingenuity is what's making the success. There are many, many brilliant people who are poor. With all their genius, they don't make it. They just don't make it. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. Even though they're brilliant people. Why is it? Why is it? A very smart person should know how to make money. And it doesn't happen. Because Medeshamayim, they decided not. This is the Avodah Zorah. 
This is what we have to be mavato. The tchiyos that we have before Musaf, to mavato vat yitzara vat the zara, meaning to say that there's something else which governs this world, which makes success in the world besides Hashem. And who's that? That's me. That's the word of It's my fault. I have to put my energy into it. I have to put my kach into it. And if I do a good job, it's going to work. If I'm careful, it'll work. I'll get the experts. We'll work together. It's going to work. We'll be successful. It's nourishment. It's nourishment. We have to truly do our eshtadlis. We have to make efforts. We have to try to do the best we can. But the results are nowhere near our input. The results come only from Hashem. There's a gzeim in Hashemayim since Adam Arishon, b'zeis ha'pechet tocha lechem. A person has to sweat in order to eat. I shouldn't want you to sweat, but your sweat is going to bring the bread? No, no, no way. In no way. I decide whether it grows or it doesn't grow. I bring the rain, I bring the sun, I bring the minerals and the vitamins. You have to sweat because of what the Marisha. That's it. All right. Because yes. What about failures? Failures? If success depends on God. Yes. Failures. 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 Yeah. Depends on us? It could be. No, but no, it's all dependent on him. But while you fail, he decides if you're going to be successful or not. It's not your efforts. Sometimes your avarice could cause you that the Mitzvah Mayim, they'll pass and you're not deserving. I can understand that success depends from God, not from ourselves. But unsuccess, failures, they do depend from us very often. Yes, it could be. It could be because of your being lax, because of your uh, avarus, that they pass in Menashemayim, that you're not going to have this, you'll have less. We, yes, it's poor, but they decide. They decide. It's not a directly, and it is not, and God's not in the picture. My, my efforts will bring success, and my lack of efforts will bring failure. It doesn't work that way. Everything has to go through the Bezid Shomala. Everything goes through there. You may be a Russia and be extremely wealthy. There are plenty of them around. Plenty of them around. Remember, gangsters, Russia, Russia, and they are flowing in money. People have tremendous, tremendous millions and billions and billions and yachts and all kinds of things. And they all have all their own planes. All kinds of things. And they're not anywhere near Tzadikim. Hashem has his Cheshbonus. He's the one who decides. So the first set, in addition to the kavonis that we just brought before, the first set before Musaf, Mavato Vyats Haraf Ravadizara, meaning to say, forget about yourself. You don't run the world. Get that into your mind. And it's the Yates Hara which makes you think that you do. That you are the one who is making the decisions and you are the one who is going to have an influence on, on, the, on the results, on the outcome. It's not you. Get that. That's the the Zorah. So the first set is the Vatel and the Zorah. The second set, in the Chazor Sashats or in the Sanich Mon Esrei, and the Chesidisha, uh, they blow, and the Mukobalim, they all blow in the Sanich Mon Esrei. That's mavatol again the Yetzirah for Gili Arayos. That's very, very fitting. Gili Arayos, that is something which is done in secret. Nobody tries to publicize that they're doing in Averos with, with, uh, with, with women. They don't want to have it publicized. Keep it secret. So something that's kept secret, the time to do that is when you're davening the secret. During the silence for an esrei. The mavatol the Yetzirah for Gili Arayos. Now, Gili Arayos does not necessarily mean actual Gili Arayos with another woman. It's anything which is connected to that. Anything which is connected to that. Seeing things that you shouldn't think, thinking things that you shouldn't think in that area. All of that area has to do with women, which is forbidden. That is considered Gili Arayos. It doesn't have to be an actual act itself. Anything which is connected to such an act is also considered in the parsha of Gilead Arias. 
and that has a Yet Sahara. You want to be Mavat of the Yet Sahara for the Gili Arayas. And the last two, Chazaros Hashats, the Yet Sahara for Shvich has done it. Now, unfortunately, in our generation, life has become very, very cheap. Very cheap. There's killings going on all over the world on a daily basis. Daily basis. And it's been in the news for quite some time now. In the Arab sector up north, there have been in the last month or so, I think of 130 killings. Every day. Last year total. Last this year. Huh? Double what was last year. Last week, a woman was killed and her seven children because she was a little bit lax in her... What, a Jewish woman? Yeah. No. Yeah. What, is, what do we have to do with the Arabs? Okay, that's who they are. Excuse me? Why are we concerned with the Arabs? Because Why? Yeah. Because they are also human beings. They are also I mean, human beings. And any... Look, what, what, what the famous Chazal, when we had Kriyas Yamsuf, they want to say Shira. So Hashem says to the Malachim, you want to say Shira when the Mitzriyam are davening, I created those Mitzriyam. Masi Yadai. Masi Yadai. Hashem created the world to be a harmonious world. Understand this. Olam Chesed Yibane. Hashem created the world to be a harmonious world. What does that mean, harmonious world? That means they're going to be Jews and non Jews, but they're all going to live in harmony. Everyone is doing Chesed for everybody else. True, we are the chosen people. All right, so we're the chosen people. But so because we're the chosen people, we should be even more considerate of Hashem's creations. They are Hashem's creations too. So therefore, we don't want to see killing all the time, senseless killing. This is the Yetzirah which causes it. We have to be revived on that Yetzirah for Shvichos Dhamma, for, 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 for shedding blood. Yeah. But if... These people are wicked anyway. They want to murder Jews anyway. So we should be uh, we should be sad that they're uh, being. It, it's sad that things these things are happening. The world could be better. The world could be better. It could be better that the Jews and the Arabs were able to, to be live live you know side by side. There were periods where they lived very well together. Many, many centuries, many different countries, in Spain and all, all kinds of places, the Jews and the, and the non-Jews lived very well together. The Jews in Chev, before the Chavon massacre, they lived very well together. They were good friends. They used to invite each other to his, to his siblings. It was such a shock that the Chavon massacre in 1929, it was such a shock to everybody. You couldn't understand what, what happened. The Jews in, in, in Chevron with the Arabs were living well, well together. They were good friends. I, I, I don't understand how you can say the world was created with harmony. There was a flood. To be harmonious, to be harmonious. It was, that was Hashem's real intention. This is not actuality, maybe. It's, uh, it's, it's not because of Hashem. It, 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 it's the people who live but in Hashem the world. Hashem destroyed part of his, all of his creation. It's not, it's, no, it, that's not the way we look at it. It's our misfortunes, yeah. our misconduct, which brought about the destruction. Hashem, but Hashem knew this. That, that we can't look at that. You can't look at that. Then you're looking at you're, you're, you're becoming God. We have to look at the world as the Torah gave us a guidebook. We have to follow the guidebook. Guidebook says you're not allowed to kill. Guy are allowed, not allowed to kill either. So Zion, this is B'nai Noah. A guy's not allowed to kill either. They're allowed to murder. They can't. Kill. Oh well. Everyone is supposed to live harmoniously. When the world doesn't work properly, then we, in a sense, have to think that we caused all of the tragedies which are going on, because we are not living properly. properly. So this is the Yates Hurrah for bloodshed. Shvich was done it. This is what the last 30 are supposed to be mavatal. That Yates Hurrah to kill. The Yates Hurrah to kill. Shvich was done it. And then the last 10, mavatal the Yates Hurrah for Loshon Hurrah. And the Yates Hurrah for Loshon Hurrah, we understand very well if you look through the al on Yom Kippur, you'll see that most of the al the highest percentage is Avevis, which have to do with Dibur. 
Most of the Averis of the, of the al have to do with things that people say. This is the most precious, I would say, uh, Mida that we have over the, w- the entire world. Nobody in the world, except the human beings, express themselves with speech. They have sounds, they have body language, which give over a message. We know that, we know that a cat has, is very happy, you'll see his tail is straight up in the air. I know this because I have cats all around me, people feed the cats, and I see when the people come with the food, the cats, the tails go up, they're very, very happy. That's the body language of the cats, that's how they communicate. Communicate. But we have the ability to communicate with speech. It's such a precious command. We can, uh, we can transfer very, very, let's say, I would say, uh, subtle ideas. That you can't do that with body language so well. Subtle ideas, subtle differences, all kinds of shades of things that we can do with speech. It's an amazing, amazing ability that we have. What a wonderful me that it is. And take that and just desecrate it with Lush and Hara and speak evil. And that is a Yet Sahara. There's a Yet Sahara. So all of these just things that we mentioned, they're all a Yet Sahara. And if you have Kavanas during the shofar for these things, then it will have a direction, it will have an effect. And not only on you, it will affect you, your family, your friends, all the people around you. So have this sheet in front of you during the shofar blowing on Rosh Hashanah. So you remind yourself, just don't listen to see, does he know how to blow the shofar? Let, leave that to him. You have to listen, listen. at that time, I want to know that I'm being machav in this, I want the shofar to do this, I want the shofar to do that. That's the important, important thing when you have the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. Okay, question? No? You had something? Yeah? Oh, uh, I, I could say in, in Tachman every morning, uh, these are the Sephardic portions. Say, uh, you know, I've said gossip and slander. Excuse me? Excuse me? That, uh, that uh, one of the things that you, uh, in, in the uh, in Tachman, is that you say you, you say gossip and slander. All right. Yeah, and then that's what you're, you're you know, yeah, but that, that the words can. But on, on Rosh Hashanah, you have to be very, very conscious of it and realize yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. All right, those are the, 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 of course, I want to tell you something. There are some places in Rosh Hashanah, I know that in one place in Meir Sharim, Tekiah Shefer takes them an hour and a half. If you imagine a regular shul if Tia Shefer took an hour and a half, mm-hmm. what that would do to the people, what they would, it would be so upsetting it would be a, a catastrophe. But by this particular Hasidish uh, group, it takes an hour and a half. Why? Because the Baal Tokea doesn't have only these kavanos. He has the kavanos of the Arizal, of the Rashash. He has many, many things that he's thinking of, and in between, he's reviewing the thoughts, and when he's ready, he thinks that his mind is able to concentrate when he's blowing on those kavanos, then they stand up and they blow the shofar. But it takes him time because there are so many complicated kavanas to have during the Tkiah Shofar that he needs time to concentrate and, and, and get all his thoughts together. So be able to do it while he's blowing, he has to have those kavanas. So in between each set, he has to think. Everybody sits down and look at the swarim. It takes an hour and a half to finish all the Tkiahs. This is before Musaf. So we should realize that these kavanas that we have are very simple. And it doesn't have to take more than a few minutes, the whole thing, if you know how to blow. But you should have this in front of us so that the blowing will have a greater quality. It will be directed to specific things, not just stam. Does he know how to blow the shofar? Okay, because it's the main mitzvah, the outstanding mitzvah of, of Rosh Hashanah, the Tkiah shofar. So what happens like on Shabbos? We don't go to the shofar. Very good. So how do we get these same kavanas? Very good. Well, hopefully, hopefully, Shabbos is a replacement. These kavanas you can't have because they're not blowing the shofar. But it could be that because of the kedushas on Shabbos that it's not necessary. It sort of replaces it. The Shabbos will accomplish, hopefully, what the shofar tried to accomplish automatically without our participation. Hopefully. What, 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 can we, what can we say? What about, yeah. 
the end of each section where we blow the shofar. Yeah. And uh, we, we don't say anything. Is there a way of... Ayom Harat Olam. You say or not? Ayom Harat Olam, yeah, 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 sure. So we can incorporate these thoughts at that point? Uh, it's better to, better to think of these thoughts while he's blowing, or before, not afterward. Right, right. Better before or while. There's no blowing, you don't have to worry about these thoughts. Excuse me? Because there's no blowing, because of Shabbos, right. we don't need to use these thoughts. That's correct. Only, only on, the, on Sunday, Mir Tashem, when they'll be blowing, then you have to bring these thoughts into, uh, into action. Okay, that's the first sheet that you have. All right, there's another thing I want to mention here. That's not on the sheet. The second sheet what even... What is written in the sheet? Yes. Which one? On the bottom? Yes. It says the Hamtakas Adin Ayyidei Tshuva. That's also a thought to have, that the, the din is sweetened by a person doing tshuva, Avram Yitzhak. Okay, it's not so... It's, it's a little bit more complicated. We don't need it so much. We don't need it. We, the main points, we went, we went over. Okay, there's another point here that it's not on the sheets. We have to remember this also. This is going to be surprising to you and in tremendous contrast to what we were just speaking about right now. Tremendous con- contrast. Rosh Hashanah is a yantif. It is also, because it's a yantif, it's, it's a day of simcha. It's a day of simcha. And uh, it seems to be a little bit contradictory called days of awe, days of awe, so um, how can I really be with Simcha? Well, you can. If you know what we're going to discuss right now, you'll be able to also be able to be the Simcha at the same time. First of all, you have to be very with Simcha, and you should write this down and not forget it. Last year, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there was a Psak Din in Shemayim about you. Now, you didn't know last year what the Psak Din is going to be. You didn't know if you're going to live through the year or not. You didn't know what kind of a year are you going to have. A year of health, a year of sickness, chas v'shalom, a year of tragedy. You didn't know. And here you are, again, a year passed, and you're still here. You're still here. So the first thing is that on Rosh Hashanah you have to be very, very happy that you are still here. You made it through the year. So that's important, to have that feeling of simcha on Rosh Hashanah. It's very, very important. You need to pass through the year in bad health? That's right. Because even if you pass in bad health, better or better, then no health at all. <laughs> we are not here. Nonetheless, you are here. You're still here, and Hashem is giving you more time for tikkunim. So the first thing is, you have to have on Rosh Hashanah a kind of simcha. And it's a yantif. It's a yantif. And on yantif we have the halachah So you have to be happy that you are alive on Rosh Hashanah. Be happy. And davening with that happiness. And what do we say at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah? The Kiddush. At night when we come home, don't you say a Shechiyonu? Say a Shechiyonu and Kiddush. When you come home from Rosh Hashanah at night from Shul, you say a Shechiyonu and Kiddush. Thank God I made it through the year. You don't know what's going to be this year, what the Psach is going to be. And you made it through the year? Wow. It should be dancing. It should be dancing at Kiddush, at the, at, the, at, the, at the table. I made it through the year, from last year to this year. I made it. A lot of people who didn't make it through the year, I made it through the year. Yes, it's a simcha. Be very, very happy that you made it through the year. You have to be so thankful, so grateful to Hashem at Kiddush that you made it through the year and you're starting another year. So it's important to have the feeling of simcha, not only of days of awe, of awesomeness, of fear, that's important too, but you have to be able to live on both sides. You have to have the days of war, very serious days, but you cannot ignore 
the great, tremendous gratitude and simple that you have that you are still alive and you're here. So you have to have that. It's very important. Don't appreciate what I give you? Then maybe I won't give you anymore. To show your appreciation and be very, very besimcha. Also, at Kiddush, all, all day Rosh Hashanah, be very besimcha. Okay, that's number one. A second thing is very important is bitachon in Hashem's chesed. You have to realize that there's no greater bal chesed than a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And if you have bitachon in his chesed, you are starting off on the right foot. If someone has faith in you, because they know that you have the power to accomplish certain things, and they need you, and they're dependent on you. Because you know people are dependent on you, you will try to fulfill their expectations. You don't want to disappoint them. Well, that very simple concept applies on Rosh Hashanah too. We have bitachon and Hashem, Hashem is the biggest Baal Chesed that we can possibly imagine. And if Mezesh Bezet Hashem, he's going to pass in Hashanah Taiva Umesuka. And therefore, this will influence the Psak that you get on Rosh Hashanah. Hashem will see that you have bitachon on him, meaning to say, you're not reliant on your own merits. <coughs> you are not reliant on your own merits. You know, within all that, including all the merits you have, you still have to come on to Hashem's chesed. If He is not going to bestow His kindness upon you, and all you have is your merits, then your merits are going to be weighed very, very carefully against your demerits. And how can we make the proper cheshben, which is going to be more abundant than the other? We can't make that cheshbon. We can't weigh those things. We have to come on to the chassadim of HaKadosh Baruch to His kindness. And therefore, you have to really feel it, you have to internalize that, that you have bitachon, that Hashem's kindness will have a strong influence on your psak. And if you have faith in somebody, you are reliant on Him, there is much more reason to believe and tendency for him to come through with your bitachon on him. Okay. Now comes a hard one. Now comes the hard one. The way you start off the year has a great influence on the entire year. That's the way things work in the world. The first influences what comes afterwards. So it's very, very important. You have to think about this beforehand. You can't do it in the last moment. You have to prepare yourself. You have now the month of El to prepare yourself for this. <clears throat> Rosh Hashanah is also a Yom Tif. On the Yom Tif there is a mitzvah of Simcha. The mitzvah of, of Simcha on Yom Tif. And you have to try to put yourself into a mindset of simcha. Now, what does simcha mean? Simcha does not mean that you have a big belly laugh. That's not what simcha means. Simcha means inner content. That's what true simcha means. Ezehu ashir hasameach bechelko. Someone who is contented with his lot. That's what simcha means. And it's very, very important to have that feeling of simcha. Start off the year on the right foot. The way you start off the year influences the entire year. So if you have simcha on Rosh Hashanah, that is an excellent start for the year. In other words, you are contented. You are feel at home with Hashem. And you know that if you're sameach with Him, Hashem will be sameach with you too. It goes, it's a two-way street. Mida connected Mida. And therefore, it's very, very important to be sameach on Rosh Hashanah. It's very hard because it's the Yom Adin. Very hard. 
So that's why we have this whole period of Elul to work on ourselves to get it perfected so we can do it. Very important to be Samir Sameach on Rosh Hashanah. To start off the year with Simcha. That means an inner content. You have complete faith, complete, I would say, contentment with Hashem. You know that Hashem is going to only do the best and He's always looking to find schus for us. And we're going to do our best and therefore, there's no reason not to be b'semcha. That means an inner content. Doesn't mean you have to walk around laughing and, and, and all that. But pl- a pleasantness, not to walk around with a sad face on Rosh Hashanah. Not to walk around with a sad And you know, ma- many yeshivas, they walk around sad and worried, and you know, hadin, and what's going to be. That's not good. It's not good. I mean, it's better than just taking the day very unseriously and just a big joke. Better to be that way than to just make a joke out of it. But it's important to have an inner contentment. An inner contentment. I'm, I'm Sameach. I'm, I'm happy. Whatever Hashem does, He's going to do the best. I'm Sameach with Hashem. To be innerly content. And remember also, Rosh Hashanah is one of the Chagim. The mitzvah of a Samach de Bechagyacha applies to Rosh Hashanah too. It's also a Chag. So they have a, a mitzvah de Araisa to be Sameach. And sameach does not mean that you have to laugh and dance. It means an inner contentment. Very, very important, that inner contentment. Okay, okay so those are the first four important points that we mentioned, which are no geya. Now we have mentioned something. Uh, I counted three, Rabbi. We had, first of all, oh, you're right. Okay, the first, I didn't mention the first one. I skipped it, by the way, on my sheet here, I skipped it. No, no, no. The first one is, the other one is, you have to be thankful to Hashem that you're still alive. Right. That's, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't bring that in. I didn't say it before. Yes. Yeah, that was the first one. Yes, you did say it. I did say it? Yes. yes. With the Shekhi Yanu? Yes. Oh, okay, it's so included in the Shekhi Yanu. All right, fine. All right, fine. Okay. <clears throat> now, here comes the difficult one. Here comes the difficult one. What about this Indian of crying on Rosh Hashanah? That's what about this crying? Is it correct to cry in Rosh Hashanah or not? We understand the Indian, the feeling of being innerly content and happy that you are here to start off the year again. And you're content and you're, you're sameach with that. And it's also a chag. It's a mitzvah to be sameach and a chag. So what about the other Indian of crying? Is there a reason to cry? And if so, what is the reason? Well, you might say that you realize all year long that you're not the Seder. There are plenty of things that you were negligent in. And now you're doing tshuva. It's the first day of a service you made tshuva. And you're really, really remorseful about it. And therefore, you're crying over your failures. That's acceptable. It's acceptable. But it's much better. It's much better if you cry over the following. Try to imagine, try to imagine for a minute your own personal shortcomings, your own personal tsar. And then you have a neighbor, you have a friend, he has his problems. Problems with sickness, problems with failure, problems with poverty. Everybody's got problems. Everybody's got problems. Expand it, not only to your friends that you know, what about all the other people? What about, go, go to the hospital, see what's doing in there. All the, all the wards are full. Go to the hospital, take a walk through the hospital. And there are more than one hospital in Eretz Israel. There's hospitals all over the world. And there's so much ra in the world. It's mind-boggling. You can really go crazy from it. You're thinking about all of the corruption that's going on all over the world. There's so much killing in the world. So much death in the world. There's so much sickness in the world. There's so many things in the world that are so negative. And do you know? There's one thing that feels it all. And that's the Shechina. The Shechina collectively feels all of the Tsar in the entire world. 
That's mind-boggling. No human being could possibly remain sane and contain that within him. No one. And Rosh Hashanah, we have to feel identification with the Tzar of the Shechina. And therefore you should cry. Therefore you should cry. Imagine the Tzar of the Shechina. The Shechina would hope to have happiness all over the world. And look at all the corruption all over the world. All the killings, all the sickness. It's going on all over the world. And the Shechina is not Bitzar. Of course the Shechina is Bitzar. We have to identify, not only think about ourselves, think about the Tzar of the Shechina. And therefore we should cry. This is a very, very difficult. On one hand, be the Simcha. As we just spoke before. You're alive. You made it through the year. You have so much to be thankful for. On the other hand, there's plenty of reason to cry. But it's not for personal things. Not for personal things. The Tsar of the Shekhinah. You want to identify with the Tsar of the Shekhinah. Imagine the collective Tsar that's going on in the entire universe. The entire globe. That's what's going on. You can't even imagine it. Can't even imagine it. The Shechina is crying. We should cry with the Shechina too. It's very, very important to have that in your mind on Rosh Hashanah. The Tsar of the Shechina. It's dealing with paradox. Hmm? It's dealing with paradox. Yes, yes. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the beauty of being a Jew. Realizing these things. The Tsar of the Shechina. The Golas of the Shechina. You have to have this in mind on Rosh Hashanah too. And then, of course, you have uh, feelings of Rachmanis for all of Kal Yisrael, that everyone should see the truth and get back on the right path. Very important to have that in mind too. Not only think about yourself, think about all the other Jews in the world who are off the track, and they have no idea that they're off the track. That's the problem. They have no idea that they're off the track. They're so far gone, they don't even know the difference. They don't know the difference between a Jew and an Amjur. That's how far gone they are. And then the third thing is, it's important to have even to cry about it, but a crying of simcha crying of Simcha, that you are privileged to be here and to know and think of everything we said today. To think about that in Rosh Hashanah. You are not aware of all this and you're still here and you're able to experience it. And you're identifying with the Tsar of the Shechina. You're feeling the Tsar of the Shechina. If you identify with the Tsar of the Shechina, the Shechina will take care of you also. So this is today's shir, preparation for the Yom Aroyim. Next Sunday, Mitzvah Hashem will be the last year before Rosh Hashanah. We have more things that were important to learn. Stay tuned, and I hope to see you next week. Mitzvah Hashem. Go ahead.